In the first part of 1971, on a small island near the Aleutians, the second underground nuclear test took place. This is what happened. The craft of film dubbing, uh, that is, recording new dialogue in a foreign language, to allow a, a film to be exported abroad, it's a thankless and mostly anonymous job. It's become an old cliché to mock the stilted voices and the out-of-sync lip movements, but the truth is that without the efforts of those men and women who labored in obscurity to translate and transform films from their native tongues into the English language, it might never have been possible for countless exploitation films from Asia, Europe, and other parts of the world to have ever been released in the United States. And few people have dubbed more films into English than Mr. Ted Thomas, a Hong Kong-based broadcaster, journalist, author, and for many years, one of the most prolific dubbing voice actors and directors in this little-known and little-understood business. Thomas provides the voice of the narrator and the emperor of Cetopia in Godzilla vs. Megalon, and his voice is heard in the English version of a number of other Toho films, such as Matango, Dogara the Space Monster, and Godzilla vs. Gigan. That's to say nothing of the literally hundreds of Hong Kong action films he helped bring to the West. The effects of the explosion were widespread, even on faraway Monster Island in the South Pacific. The man with the unmistakable voice, welcome Ted Thomas. We're very pleased to speak with you today. That's very kind of you. Thank you. It's uh, early afternoon here. We thought it would be interesting to talk a bit about the process and the business of dubbing films because it's still a subject that's not uh, terribly well understood, and it's certainly not an occupation that, that gets a lot of respect even now. Dubbing has been the butt of a lot of bad jokes over the years, as you know. Um, but, but you didn't really start in the film business, did you? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background before we get to the dubbing work? Yeah, I, was, I came to Hong Kong working for British Naval Intelligence, actually. After the Korean War, we were trying to prevent um, smugglers uh, who later became very respectable and, and seen uh, very uh, important and wealthy business figures in Hong Kong, uh, and Macau especially, um, who were smuggling uh, strategic goods against the United Nations uh, regulations into China. China was still, uh, don't forget, this is in 1955, it had only been like going for about five or six years and was not at all respectable. Um, so they were... Um, uh, not receiving the sort of strategic goods they needed to have. And this is not necessarily weapons. These are silly things like, like um, uh, ker kerosene and gasoline and oil and stuff like that. And the boats that used to travel up and down the Pearl River, usually from Macau, were called green parrots. Not that they were green, but they were very, very fast, and they were much faster than the naval boats p pursuing them. So we had to be better on the guns when we could hit them. <laughs> That's a long way, though, from from naval intelligence to the film business. Uh, well, not necessarily, because when I was in the Mediterranean, I was um, uh, I was very keen on on broadcasting, and I was on a, 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 on board a, a large aircraft carrier or a small aircraft carrier, actually, it was Ocean, it was a light fleet carrier. They had a studio, and I used to do radio programs, and from there I went to broadcasting. Um, in um, in northern Italy, and they had a radio station there, it belonged to uh, British Forces Broadcasting, and I started broadcasting on that. That was my first broadcasting. So when I got to Hong Kong, and I finally got bored with the intelligence business, I started doing broadcasting part time, and uh, did very well out of it. And from that, I was invited by Ron Ron Shaw who now, by the way, is over 100 years old, about 102 or 103 years old, uh, to come in and test out film dubbing and see how I liked it, uh, which I did. And uh, it was very primitive in those days, uh, but I enjoyed it because um, I used to enjoy doing funny voices, and I still do, in fact. So that's how I got into the movie business, uh, through radio broadcasting, through Run Run Shore, uh, ultimately, um, of course, through um, his successor, who started um, Golden Harvest Films, Raymond Shaw, and uh, eventually met um, mm. uh, and worked with Bruce Lee. And, of course, doing the, the dubbing on his films that led us to um, a great deal of success. But you, it sounds like you started actually dubbing films into English back in the, was it the late 50s, early 60s? Is that about when you started? The late 50s, yeah. It was late 50s. I think it would have been um, 
probably 56, 57, something like that. Okay, so that was well before the Hong Kong action movie boom. And, and, and what, what types of films were you dubbing, for, and, and where were they being exported to at that time? Well, we were getting, um, first of all, <clears throat> what Run Run did for the movie industry, of course, he came here, he recognized the Cantonese movies, which were really bad, you know. Uh, I, I mean, so bad that when they wanted a, a romantic scene, you could see on the screen in the cinema that the moon was a piece of cardboard hanging from a piece of string, and the actual string could be seen on the screen. It was that bad. Run Run decided to widen the audience by um, recording all his movies in Putonghua, in the Mandarin. Uh, so immediately that expanded the audience from uh, Hong Kong and a bit of an audience in Guangzhou at, at the Canton district to worldwide uh, Chinese. And that's not just China, of course. That was Chinese in America, Chinese in Europe, Chinese in Australia, Canada and everywhere. Um, so he was on the right track. He was granted a large plot of land to build his studios, and and I was his um, consultant regarding anything to do with the English language. What what were some of the? Uh, I don't know if any of the films in those early days uh, that you worked on were actually uh, exported to the United States. But what would have been some of the the better known or, or more popular films that you worked on during that early period? Well, uh, the, uh, the the original ones were Japanese that that Run Run had the agency for. Uh, you probably remember Zatoichi, the the, the one armed swordsman. Um, I mean, it was a tremendously popular uh, series. Um, and uh, we did those, and then we did a lot of other for our Tohai Film Company uh, from Japan, and they were um, usually fairly far-fetched. You know, had to do a lot of grunts and shouts, and not much in the way of dialogue, which we liked best of all because we didn't have to lip sync it. But um, basically speaking, a runner's best movies at that time were were Japanese, um, who were streets ahead of us in technique for making movies. Uh, but as well as that, of course, he soon started bringing m films in from Malaysia, from Singapore, of course, uh, not very good films from Singapore. Uh, and then they started coming in from South America and from Europe. And I remember dubbing films that were the original language is uh, Yugoslavian, or one of the Yugoslavian dialects, you know, a Serbo-Croat or something like that. Um, and what, the, the thing we sorted out about it was that I didn't even know to start with that you had to cut the film into pieces, sort of one-minute pieces, and then put it into a loop. And then you uh, crowd around a microphone with the mouth about 10 feet wide, and you fitted the dialogue to uh, the picture, the moving picture. And a friend of mine, a guy called Ron Oliphant in the United States, was uh, later in the United States, was here at the time, uh, he was prepared to sit at home uh, after recording the the soundtrack on a um, uh, an audio sound recorder, you know, a tape recorder, and uh, cut it into one, ma and then go through it inch by inch, I mean, syllable by syllable, uh, to make the voice fit. Now, of course, the number of Chinese, Yugoslavian, Japanese words uh, to say the same thing in English is often different. But if it was something very simple, like in, in Chinese you'd say, for how are you, uh, lay ho ma. But uh, the, the, the problem is the closed mouth sounds, like M, B, and P. Mm -hmm. um, and you, of course you can't fake that with, with dubbing. If the guy says, um, um, uh, my mother, he's got to have two closed sounds. For, and, uh, although if you're saying it in Chinese, it's going to be totally different. So this is the thing you had to get around by substituting various words. And the M's, B's, and P's with the closed mouth sounds were always difficult. Uh, but Ron Oliphant had immense patience and sat at home with an old uh, uh, um, uh, half-inch tape recorder inching through the soundtrack and making the words fit. And the most expensive thing we had was actors, because the good dubbing actors were first class. Mm. They could watch a loop go through once or twice and say, right, ready, record. Because they knew the minute they finished, they were out of there to a big slap-up dinner and a few beers and go home. Um, in fact, it was very awkward for new actors who wanted to learn the business, but uh, they couldn't because the old actors were too impatient with them. And they say, oh, come on, for Christ's sake, if you can't do, get the fuck out of here. Um, and that's what they had to do. You know, you had to got in and, and made your way to doing it, or you, you were out. Um, but we did that mainly through all Ron Oliphant's being prepared to sit there hour after hour, going through syllable after syllable, and keeping the time of the actors in the studio down to a minimum.
It's an impossible and a thankless job because you just cannot match English words to the mouth movements of someone speaking Chinese or Japanese or Yugoslavian or whatever it is because the language is... Well, I don't entirely... I, I agree with you mainly, of course, and it's unarguable, but in a way you can make a very good... You can make it believable mm. if the actor can act the part. If he's talking in a wooden voice and he's saying something, get back, get back, or I will kill you, of course he's not going to work. But if he can act... And he said, get back, get back, or I'll fucking murder you. Then it's going to be more believable, even if the lips don't match exactly. Mm. So we looked for good actors and also good lip sync dubbers. And in fact, a lot of the problems, you're quite right, when you looked at the Finnish, um, Finnish film, you squirm with embarrassment because it didn't match. But that was when they put the tape recording, uh, which was they first recorded on before they put it onto an optical soundtrack, when they matched it together, they, they got it wrong. Mm. You know, the technical expertise then was nothing like it is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, now if I go in to, to match something to a movie, uh, I don't have to be in a room full of actors. They say, OK, Ted, do that, do, do your bit there. I say, oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. that thing. They say, don't worry, because they can inch it back and forward and make it fit. Right. But they couldn't do that in those days. And I think the, the technology of putting the the audio soundtrack that we'd recorded onto a transform to a, a, um, a video soundtrack, or if you like, an optical soundtrack, mm -hmm. uh, was not well enough advanced to make it perfect. Nowadays, even if you don't get it right, you can make a better job. Uh, but of course, it still depends a lot on the actors being, to some extent, plausible. Now, now, who were the actors? I assume they were all expatriates. Uh, were they Americans, British, uh, Australian? Uh, they were all sorts. They were everybody uh, who could do the part. And if they were reasonable actors and were reasonably sharp enough at matching uh, their voice to the the big flapping lips on the screen in front of them, they were they were okay and they were kept on. Did did any of them have any prior acting training? I think some did. Yes, I mean some we got to done acting, uh, uh, both professional and amateur, mm -hmm. um, and some were natural actors. But you'd only got to do one audition and say read this part. And as I say, you know, if the guy says, "Darling, darling, I love you." or he could ooze it and make it sound believable, uh, then you'd know within an instant or two whether the guy was going to be any good as an actor. Was this something that you could make a living doing, or did most of these people... Oh, uh, yes, you yes, could? you could make a living, because uh, although for the first two or three years we're the only company doing it, we, we were a company called Axis International, A-X-I-S, uh, though we didn't use the company name hardly at all. It was all done on a very old boy basis. Uh, yes, you can make a good living out of it, uh, but of course, most of the time you had to do it in the evenings and at nights because the actors were in jobs like full time broadcasting or media mm -hmm. and uh, they couldn't get away during the day. So we couldn't start till about six and then we'd often go on till midnight or one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. You send some men and keep an eye on him. Sir, General, Fong Si Yu also had a big following here. Could make trouble. I think we should get him. Fong <laughs> Si Yu won't cause us any more trouble here. I mean, his own friends will take care of that for us now. Now, can you uh, walk us through the, the process of, of dubbing a film? Uh, I mean, for instance, what happens first when you get the job to dub Godzilla versus Megalon? What would be the first thing that happens? Okay, you, uh, first, you view the film, of course. So you run through the film, you look at it, and you can then, when you get experience, you can count how many actors. Now, there may be 35 actors in the movie, but you recognize that because the voices are so different, one is is a um, silliband old creep who said, "Hello, it's very nice to meet you, and I want to get." And another is a loudmouth braggart saying, "Get the fuck out of here!" You know that one actor can do both of those, and uh, do them uh, uh, convincingly. So that's it. That's one actor. But then another part, he's going to be a lover or something. He's got to be more gentle and uh, more caring. And then you say, okay, we can get it. that guy can do three of them. So you count the actors you're going to need. And then you go home with a script. And you've got the script as a translation, but a very bad translation of, of the original uh, script. So if it was Japanese, it's going to be a very bad translation of, uh, into English of the Japanese, let's say. Uh, you go in with that, and then you work out, okay, we can do this guy, can do this part, this guy, we can do 
This guy can do these three parts, and also he'll be in the crowd scenes as well. So although there's 35 parts in this movie, we can do it with seven actors. Then you've got to you work out uh, how much you're going to pay each actor, and you work out by not shooting in sequence, but putting the crowd scenes first and then getting rid of actors as you go along, what it's going to cost you in the cost of actors. And that's the way you do it. So, uh, and that works very well. So um, the system of, of costing it is the first thing. The owner of the film, or the guy we were dealing with, and we were dealing with Ron Run Shaw, we were dealing with a chap called Dovin Chow, who ran one of uh, Ron Run Shaw's uh, offshoots called Southern Films, who we did a lot of work with. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, with Raymond Chow and his company. But, but um, basically, you've got to work out the cost of it. And normally, they were all about the same within two or three thousand Hong Kong dollars of what you could get. You laid off the cost of the actors, the cost of the studio, and what was left was yours. And generally, what was your role in the process? Were you the producer, supervisor, writer? Uh, well, everything. I mean, I, I, I founded the business because I realized, uh, as someone who's a bit of a, a ham actor anyway, uh, that it was kind of fun to do. Secondly, that it could, because we were the only ones, we could, we could make quite a bit of money out of it. Um, and thirdly, because uh, it was a very nice social event where you get together with, you know, half a dozen old chums, sit around a microphone in a crowded room, and then later go out and have a bloody good uh, blast of about a seven-course dinner and lots of drink. So you say there were five men who got away with the diamond? Yes, that's right. And Mark Jackson, what's his connection? First you see the film, then you cost it, and then you got in dear old Ron Oliphant, my dear friend, who would come along and he'd see the film again, but by this time it's cut into loops. And it loops about one minute, could any, anything from 30 seconds to two minutes. Obviously it's a crowd scene, you let it run because crowd scenes are not uh, lip-synced normally, except when, when a face comes into close-up, then you've got to lip-sync that bit. And then he'd go through it and he'd do a tape recording, a quarter-inch tape, and he'd take the tape home and he'd sit in, um, in a, a quiet room he kept for the purpose, and he'd inch through the tape, count the syllables, and make sure that his version of the English script, which was rewritten entirely, would match it syllable for syllable uh, what was going to appear on the screen. So most of the work uh, that you do normally by sitting in the studio uh, uh, trying and retrying to make it match was already done because it matched. All it needed was uh, clever actors or, or accomplished actors uh, who would watch it going through and then match it very easily because it was count every syllable was counted to fit. How many days and nights, or days or nights, did it take to dub an entire film? Uh, probably about anything from 12 to 16 hours. I mean, it was a very difficult one. It could take longer, but uh, and it was a very easy one. It could take shorter. But I would say on an average about 12 to 20 hours. We worked from 6 p.m. to about midnight. Or if we could finish, if I could say, look, guys, if we stay behind another two hours, we'll finish at 2 o'clock, we'll go out and have a blast, but you won't have to come back tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. So that meant they got paid and they didn't have to come the second night and they had a good blast anyway. Can you describe uh, the, the what the studio was like, how big it was, what was in there, what kind of equipment? It's very small. It was about, um, I would say, not bigger than about 200 square feet. And the mm -hmm. dangers to our health, looking back on it, I wouldn't go in there even to look at a movie. Uh, it was thick with cigarette smoke. Uh -huh. I mean, if there were six actors um, uh, crouching around a microphone, concentrated. They had to smoke because people used to believe when they smoked, the only way they could concentrate is to smoke. So they're all smoking and we're all breathing this stuff for like six, eight hours at a time. Why, why we didn't all drop dead, I don't know. But uh, anyway, most of us survived, uh, touch wood. Uh, were you actually working on the Shaw Studios lot or where was, the, where was your facility located? Oh, no, we, we didn't. We, they were little dubbing studios. We were in a block of flats. So if there's a noise, if something started banging, we had to stop recording because it, it wasn't completely soundproof. And it was just like a flat. And we were, they'd, they'd um, made the living room into a studio and uh, one of the bedrooms was the projector room and we'd, they cut holes in the wall for the projectors and uh, that was how it worked. Are we drifting? Yeah. To the south. The South. Where are, where are we now? The direction finder's is damaged. We're helpless. That's right. But you're the skipper, so you skipper. Yeah, skipper. 
Even on the yacht, you had to give the orders. You had to play skipper. I think the one thing I contributed to, both to broadcasting, uh, uh, to some part, not entirely, of course, uh, broadcasting and dubbing, is I invented the, the mid-Atlantic voice because the, the Americans didn't like the British voice. They said, oh, hello, old chap, how are you? Lovely to see you, because they didn't quite understand it. And the British didn't like the American accent because it was, um, it was regarded as fairly low class. So uh, what one had to do in dubbing, you had to produce what we called a mid-Atlantic accent, which wasn't too English, it wasn't too American, but was understandable by either. And so that's what uh, I... Uh, developed uh, over a period of time so my voice was used for a lot of stuff uh, for uh, when they were dubbing uh, when I wasn't in the actual film but I, I have made a number of films too where I appear on screen so uh, the, the, it wouldn't be unlikely that I would be in fact even quite recently uh, done a few movies and um, and enjoy it it brings out the ham in me your voice obviously is, is very recognizable immediately. Did you cultivate your speaking voice? Yes. Let, let, let me tell you the story. It's quite interesting. All right. Um, I was brought up in the north of England. They have a terrible accent. I'll explain the difference to you in a minute. But when I started, um, I was a DJ, as I said, uh, when I was in the Mediterranean, in Trieste and places. And I realized that my the voice the accent I had. And in Eng England, you can recognize where somebody comes from. If you ever saw Professor Higgins in My Fair Lady, you realize how easy it is. Uh, where I came from in the north of England, Cheshire, Lancashire, Yorkshire, if you, you want to say uh, words well, like a couple of ducks, two, two ducks, you know, you would say a couple of ducks. And if you were asked the Cockney to say the same thing, a couple of ducks, he'd say a couple of ducks. It's totally different. And all broadcasting was the BBC. There were no commercial stations then. So the BBC was, was the accent. And the BBC accent was standard southern. So if you said a couple of dukes, you would never get a job broadcasting. So you learnt to iron out the accent uh, to a certain extent. I mean, nowadays it's not so important. In fact, a chap tends to have more character if he's got a, um, a regional accent. Not certain regional accents, but, for example, if he's Scottish or Irish, he's usually welcomed uh, as, as a different voice. But at that time, you had to be fairly neutral with a leaning to the southern accent. So, yes, I did. I, I uh, made a point of not being too north of England. And when I go up there, which I do occasionally still, they say, uh, who the fuck are you? What's this new accent? You're talking like these posh people down south, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I, I had because that was the only way you could get to work in broadcasting in those days. You also have another career, right? As a you were a broadcaster and a television personality, isn't that true? Yes. Okay. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, okay. Well, first of all, of course, was radio because there was no television in Hong Kong when I arrived here. No television had been set up, uh, and ra and there was only one radio station, and that was. Uh, public service broadcasting, so there was no commercial radio, so I did what there was there, and uh, I did that for several years, and then in 1967, I think it was, um, they set up television here, and of course, um, I went back to the BBC to do training as a television producer, first of all, a director, first of all, and uh, then when I got back, there was no work in directing, uh, so I went into on camera as um, as an interviewer, which is the job I'd been doing in radio, so I was quite used to it. Um, and uh, then from that time on, I was doing quite a lot, I think about four programs, television programs a week. Mm. And I was still doing radio about six or seven programs a week, so it was very difficult to get away from me for, for, for Ted Thomas haters. It was very difficult. Uh, there was one was called On Camera, and uh, the other was called Be My Guest. And, and I did a lot, quite a lot of stuff when people came here to Hong Kong to do uh, movies. Uh, I usually got small parts in the movies as well because uh, recognizing what an old ham I am, they knew I enjoyed it. Did you ever appear in films uh, back in the old days, like the, the 50s, 60s when you were Oh, started? yeah. I mean, I appeared in things like the... Um, well, the 60s with uh, um, The World of Susie Wong. Okay. I'm still a very good friend of Nancy Kwan. Uh, a many splendid thing, love is a many splendid thing, but all very minor parts, you know. And I, I've, I've seen them go through several times, and I really had to look to see which one was me. 
I wondered if you remembered, I know you didn't do as many of them, but the Japanese monster films, you did several of them. I wonder if you have any recollections of those and what, what special well, requirements Well, not particularly, are. because the, the dialogue tended to be very minimal, actually. Uh, it was, it, they, these movies depended a lot on special effects. And um, so there wasn't, a, I, I wouldn't remember whether I'd been a scientist or chief of police. I remember I was chief of police in a Hong Kong movie about a, a monstrous gorilla that crawled up buildings here. And I was either, I was chief of police or head of the British Army in shooting it, I can't remember. And, and I've never seen the movie, I don't think, but um, uh, I did a lot of movies. Don't forget, sometimes we did six or seven a month. And this is, uh, what, 40 years ago. Right. No, I understand. Now, the film you're talking about with the giant gorilla is is called Mighty Peking Man, and uh, you portray the, the head of the uh, the army unit that's fighting the monster. That's right, yes. In a lot of these films, you play the villain. And, uh, yes. Well, yeah, I, I think your your voice and your acting style is, is very uh, suited to that. There's something a little bit sinister about your voice uh, in, in, in certain uh, roles. Well, I like that. I like the ro roles of villains that uh, seem to be a lot more interesting, a lot more colorful, and, and uh, allow for a lot more scope in acting than, than good, good back guys, you know? Well, there's one in particular that I, I wish we could, uh, I, I wish I could play it for you right now. It's a, another one of these uh, Godzilla films that you worked on. The, the the actor whose voice that you you're you're, you're substituting. There's a scene in which uh, it's a very small scene where he gives the hero of the story. And they're trying to to follow him to his home, and the way they yeah. do it is they give him a pack of cigarettes that has a, a like a transmitter in it, and they're going to use that to 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 track him, you know, as he goes home. Anyway, it's just this one little line where you give him the cigarettes and. And he he looks at the pack and he goes, "Oh, cigarettes!" And you and you you said, "They're for you." <laughs> yeah, that sounds like my part. Yes. Come on, rise up now, to the earth, sir. Destroy the earth. Destroy our enemies. I'll give you a good indication of dubbing now. He, at one point, he says here, "Rise up now." Now, that's not natural speech. So, obviously, the Japanese, or whatever the, the original language is, is rise up. But you had another syllable to add on. So, the, the writer put the word now in it. Right. See? This is the, 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 the art of writing for film dubbing. Uh, and one, there's, there's one saying in Chinese, particularly, uh, no, Japanese, and it's a, it's a double-digit sound, which is, I can't remember what it was, but what it... What we put in all the time was, so then. Anyway, so you find a lot, in a lot of movies we did, because it was one of our writer's peculiarities, now and again, there'd be a pause in the speech, and he'd say, so then. Uh, and you had to put something in there. I mean, there was nothing, of course, there was nothing in the dialogue to suggest what it was. So we, we'd put in the word, so then, and it became a bit of a joke amongst film dubbing actors. Every now and again, they'd say, so then. <laughs> There's also, uh, in a lot of Japanese uh, films that are dubbed, the, the characters will say, right. Yeah, uh, you'd have to tell the writers not to put in right too often, because otherwise uh, they'd fill the, the script with it. Well, when you look back on that period of your life and all those thousands of films that you dubbed, uh, I mean, what do you, how do you feel about it now? And uh, what, what's your place in uh, the history of this type of uh, exploitation film, as we call it? I think mainly um, uh, a certain amount of satisfaction, because I, I do believe we were pioneers at this business in Hong Kong. I'm sure probably people in Italy and Yugoslavia and Germany and Britain think the same thing. But where Hong Kong's concerned, where Chinese films, we, we were pioneers. And of course, presumably, um, Run Run Shaw chose us because we were less expensive. You know, we were in Hong Kong and we were using cheap flats for, for studios. So we were, uh, in, in a way, pioneers, and that is very satisfying. Um, of course, uh, I make a point of not seeing any of the movies now because I would cringe in embarrassment. But, uh, and I'm glad uh, that we were able to discuss this and hopefully uh, shed a little bit of light on the, the, all the work that you did. Megalon! 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 Wake up, Megalon! Come on, rise up now! To the Earth's surface! Destroy the Earth! Destroy our enemies! Rise up! Go on, Nicolon! <laughs> Boy, I should have had a beard before that. <laughs>